One of Tobias Singer's most effective techniques is his use of conspiracy theory reasoning. Specifically, the central claim of his Let's Get Biblical series is that the New Testament authors deliberately and maliciously changed the Tanakh so that they could paint Jesus into it. Singer also claims that the New Testament writers altered and fabricated events in the life of Jesus in order to strengthen the case for his messiahship, and that the church conspired to cover it all up. Seeing how conspiracy theories seem to be all the rage these days, it's no surprise to me why Tobias Singer is one of the most successful anti-missionaries out there. Conspiracy theories make heavy use of three techniques. Technique number one, arguing from coincidence. Conspiracy theorists love to exploit the phenomenon called pareidolia. Pareidolia is what happens when our minds impose patterns on randomness. Inkblot tests are an example of pareidolia, as is our tendency to see phases in rocks, trees, and clouds. Did a politician cancel a flight at the last minute right before a disaster, such as 9-11? There are lots of politicians, and they tend to travel a lot. Flight cancellations are not that uncommon, so it could be a coincidence. But not if you're a conspiracy theorist, it isn't. No, that cancellation is proof positive that politician is deeply involved in an elaborate conspiracy of evil masterminds. Technique number two, the use of explanatory gaps as proof of their theory. Conspiracy theorists recognize that almost any explanation will have what's called errant data, that is, facts or alleged facts that do not fit the official explanation. Errant data are the currency of conspiracy theorists, the proof that their pet theory is correct. The problem with this technique is that it often fails to properly weigh the criteria for justifying historical descriptions. The fact that a the conspiracy theory perfectly fits all data, and that fills all the holes left by the explanation, is not itself proof or even that strong of evidence that the theory is correct. Explanations are judged by a wide range of criteria, primarily the ability to predict future discoveries. Other criteria include the ability to imply other statements describing present observable data, as well as at how ad hoc the explanation is. It must include fewer new suppositions, which are not already implied to some extent by existing beliefs. Conspiracy theories tend to have strong explanatory scope, but tend to be very ad hoc or contrived. Technique number three, exploiting the audience's ignorance. I love speakers who ask questions. It helps to engage the audience. It makes the audience feel they are part of a two-way dialogue instead of a monologue. It helps the audience take interest in the subject and feel that they are the ones arriving at the speaker's conclusion. All of this is fantastic. What's not so good is when the speaker abuses the technique to derive his or her own conclusions from the often ill-informed assumptions of audience members. Here's a series of errors that conspiracy theorists often make. All of them ripped directly from Dr. Jeremy Goodenough, I think that's how his name is pronounced, of the University of East Anglia. Error number one, moving from the accepted fact that X once lied to the belief that nothing X says is trustworthy. This is a favorite of Holocaust deniers. If there is just one demonstrable mistake in, for instance, a witness statement, the whole statement is rejected as a forgery. The deniers argue that since there are several historical interpretations of the Holocaust, therefore it never happened. In other words, if one historian suggests that only 4 million Jews fell victim to the Nazi persecution, and another historian suggests 7 million, it means the Holocaust must be a false construction. Here are two, an inability to make rational or proportional means and judgments. Conspiracy theorists argue that some group of conspirators has been acting to further some aim or to prevent some action from taking place, but often fail to ask whether such a group of conspirators could further their aim in some easier or less expensive or less risky way. Error 3. Treating evidence against the theory as evidence for it. Conspiracy theorists do not just argue that the evidence could point toward a different conclusion. Rather, they claim that the evidence supporting the official verdict is suspect, fraudulent, faked, or coerced. And because this fraudulent evidence exists, that further proves that the conspiracy theory is correct. Error number four, the classical logical fallacy of post hoc ergo propter hoc. After this, therefore, because of this. The conspiracy theorist claims that because event B occurred after, or even as the result of event A, therefore event A was caused to bring about event B. For example, the First World War happened after the death of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and there is clearly a sense in which it happened because of his death. There is a causal chain leading from the death of the Archduke to the First World War. Though these effects of the assassination may seem obvious now, that is no indication that such a progression was obvious to the people involved in these events at the time. There is no evidence that the people who assassinated the Archduke had any clue that it would bring about a world war. 
Hindsight is overwhelmingly clearer than foresight. We observe these errors all the time in Tobias Singer's tape series. For example, he commits error number one when he argues that the New Testament accounts contradict each other in certain details and therefore cannot be trusted to represent history. Quite the contrary, Livy and Polybius give two irreconcilable accounts of Hannibal's campaign as he crossed the Alps in his invasion of Rome, yet no historian doubts that Hannibal did mount such a campaign. Singer then dismisses the Septuagint as a church invention. Singer claims as his evidence that in the Book of Acts, Acts 7.14 to be exact, Stephen described the entrance of the patriarchs into Egypt, but Stephen got the number wrong claiming there were 75 souls that went from Canaan rather than 70, which is stated by the Masoretic text in Genesis 46.27, Exodus 1.5, and Deuteronomy 10.22. Fine, but then Singer makes the claim that the church altered the Septuagint so that the text in those three locations would fit Stephen's speech. The Septuagint, or at least the Pentateuch, was translated from Hebrew into Greek under Ptolemy Philadelphus around 250 years before the birth of Jesus. Singer claims that the church changed the numbers in the text to cover Stephen's error. How does he deal with the fact that the Septuagint still reads 70 souls in Deuteronomy? Obviously the church blundered when they altered the text and missed it. How is it we have no manuscript evidence of the alleged tampering, such as ancient fragments that read 70 in all three places and are in Greek? The church was powerful enough to destroy all those documents and cover its tracks. The argument uses technique number two, where Singer concocts his elaborate tale of fraud and conspiracy. He then goes to the text to imply that the textual evidence perfectly fits his theory's predictions. In reality, he looked at the difference in the text, contrived a story for it to fit it. It would be a lot easier for the church to cover Stephen's alleged error by altering his speech in the Book of Acts, over which the church had far greater control than it did over the Greek Pentateuch. Singer also paints the church as an entity crafty, organized and powerful enough to obliterate all manuscript evidence of its alterations, and yet stupid and careless enough to forget to alter Deuteronomy. By the way, the Dead Sea Scrolls at Qumran agree with the Septuagint, so Stephen might have been quoting a variant of the text. Regardless, Singer's explanation is one of a Rube Goldberg variety. It's woefully and unnecessarily fanciful. One of the best ways to prepare yourself for dealing with people like Tobias Singer is to learn the methods and fallacies behind conspiracy theorists by reading articles in the links below. Shalom Aleichem.